Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar on employee well-being and productivity in the digital COVID age. I am Princy Belinda, and I work as a product marketer for Zoho People. Today, we have Andrew Spence with us. So for people who do not know about Andy, uh, here is a little uh, an overview. So Andrew Spence is a globally renowned uh, thought provoking speaker on topics related to how organizations can harness technology to build better organizations and uh, also about the future of people management and successful digital transformation. Andy has completed his master's in cognitive science and artificial intelligence from the Birmingham University in the UK. And he's also worked with over 30 complex uh, transformation programs with organizations like uh, John Louis Partnership, Novartis, and other government services, including health, prisons, and transport. He's also um, recognized for his contributions uh, as one of the top 100 HR tech influencers in 2020. So that's about uh, Andy. And uh, before we move on to the webinar, I'd like to give you a gist of uh, what's in store for today. So uh, first, uh, Andy will be talking to you about uh, how you can improve your employee well-being and productivity uh, strategies in the digital COVID age. And also followed by that, we'll have a short overview about Zoho People and how it can help your organization. Finally, we'll have a live Q&A session where Andy will be answering your questions. So that's pretty much about it. So now over to you, Andy. Well, thank you for the introduction, Princey. And thank you for everybody who's watching this webinar today, whether you're in Manchester, Baghdad, Cairo, or Mumbai, you are very welcome. On a personal note, I do hope that you and your family are, are coping okay in these challenging times. Now today, I'm going to talk about well-being and productivity in the context of what I call the digital COVID age in association with Soho people. Now the pandemic has caused a drop in employment that was 14 times bigger than after the last financial crisis a decade ago. And it's been estimated by the World Health Organization that 115,000 healthcare workers have died in the pandemic so far. Now, when we work, it is a reasonable expectation that our health is not impeded, but sadly, that wasn't the case for these workers and their families. But amazing feats have been carried out in the workplace by teams in every care home, hospital, supermarket, and delivery depot. And it's been HR leaders who have done a great job in the last year, keeping our organizations going. Now, if there's three things I would like you to take away from this webinar today. The first is that employee well-being is worth measuring and understanding in your organization. The second is the, the approach to monitoring and improving employee well-being is similar to other workforce goals. You need a well-tuned workforce measurement engine, and you also need to take an holistic approach. And three, this is a real area where HR can lead the organization in their role as people scientists and workplace technologists. Now you might see on the slide cover here, this is a photo that I took near where I live on the south coast of England. So when I'm not giving webinars or advising clients, I like to walk by the sea and personally, this gives me uh, a positive sense of well-being. A little bit about me. I've been lucky to see some great ways of working where teams of people are empowered to achieve wonderful things. Now, although we're talking about well-being, I am not a doctor, but I have healed a few organizations with life-threatening diseases from the pharmaceutical company, which interviewed each candidate 12 times, to the London Psychiatric Hospital, where nurses used to deliver their leave requests in person on paper forms, to the Bangalore Service Center that had no customers. And we're talking about well-being, but I'm not gonna give you the secrets to a happy and fulfilling life, I'm sorry. 
I know many attendees today are from India, where four major religions originated. So there might be more luck there. And I'm not going to tell you that the secret to well-being is going for a nice walk by the beach, um, because that won't solve everyone's problems either, each to their own. Now, my passion is to make work better, much better. And I try and do this through my research and writing on organizational strategy, what I call the new infrastructure of work, um, and people analytics. And I share this for free on my Workforce Futurist newsletter, which you can subscribe to. Now, the questions for today's webinar. Questions drive all my work, as you can imagine. So, why is employee well-being important? What is employee well-being, and how is it me measured? How are employers using technology to support well-being? Here's a big question. Does increased well-being actually increase productivity? And what can HR do to improve well-being? So there are the questions for the webinars. But before we start, I would like to ask you a question. Now, if you look at your screens today, there is a poll that I would like you to answer with your first reaction. So today, how are you feeling today? Having a great day? Do you feel good? Or are some of you ready for bed already? Well, look at that. So far, the voting looks like the vast majority of people are having a good day. That's great to hear. Um, that's 86% heading up to 90. Now, there's a few people. I think there's a couple of people in Cairo and in Australia who are ready for bed already. Well, we're going to liven you up a little bit with this webinar. Uh, it's great to have all of you here and in such good form. So, my second question, now we've warmed up, is what is the most important reason to care about employee well-being in your organization? I'd like you to, to give your, your gut reaction to this. The first one, A, duty of care. You know, it's the right thing to do as employers. Or B, ultimately to improve productivity, the bottom line. Because, you know, if people aren't well, they're not delivering for your organization. Tell me, let's have a look at the results as they come through. Well, this is fascinating. It's really close, actually. Um, so for duty of care, we've got 43%. But you're a bit of a hardline group, actually, because you think well-being, the reason to care about it, is to improve productivity, 57%. I will show you the results, hopefully, on this tool. That is quite interesting. So why is well-being important? Well, well-being includes not only the physical health, but also the mental, emotional, and spiritual components, which constitute the entire human experience. We know the pandemic has not only damaged our physical health, but also our mental health, too. And about 40% of adults in the U.S. reported struggling with their mental health in June last year. And actually, if you look at productivity during the lockdown, it's quite good. 88% of employees feel they get at least as much done, if not more, working from home. However, the downside is that employees' responses on mental health and well-being are ranking low. So I think, you know, the main reasons for understanding employee well-being in organizations are, as you rightly say, duty of care, we have to, and it does impact productivity directly and indirectly. Now, this is on the agenda for many, many companies at the moment. So here's a quote from Unilever. If you want a high-performing company, you need resilient, healthy employees. Uh, they, they employ 155,000 people in 190 countries, Unilever. Now, in surveys of leaders, the top concerns are employee engagement at 56%, burnout at 53%, and reduced productivity. They're all big problems for leaders, and they're all interrelated. 
even yesterday, I read that a company called uh, the Bumble app, a dating app with 700 workers, has given all of the company one week off work to recover from burnout, which is a good, a good perk for them in some ways. But in another, it made me think, are they just going back to the same environment that caused burnout? So the question for you as leaders is what causes well-being? What can cause burnout? And how do we prevent that? A doctor will give you a pill to temporarily relieve your symptoms. But we should always be looking for the underlying cause to find a solution to long-lasting healing. And the World Health Organization found that European organizations lost $140 billion a year in productivity due to common mental disorders. That's a lot of money. Employers do have a duty of care to their workers to provide safe working environments. That includes preventing accidents, which is a big focus in industries such as construction, in mining, in energy. But it also means that employers need to provide work that is free from harassment, discrimination, and toxic work cultures, which cause low morale and mental health issues. So in the COVID era, era, it's not just health workers who have had increased exposure to risk of disease. There was a survey, a study in California, and it found that warehouse workers um, have had the highest increase in pandemic-related deaths at 57%. And about half of our workers in some cities can work from home, so we're protecting them from illness, which has been great. But indirectly, organizational leaders have learned how to respond to crises and changes in the environment. HR has become more agile, I think. And the next challenge, we're going to need that agility because I think industries will be restructuring. There'll be new business models and HR will need to realign the workforce once again. You know, there's talk of hybrid work or whatever, but we need to use the same principles for designing any work. And that includes looking after well-being and productivity. So you may well ask, well, what is employee well-being? One definition would have it as well-being integrates mental health and physical health, resulting in more holistic approaches to disease prevention and health promotion, which should intuitively make sense to you. And there's seven, uh, at least seven, interrelated domains of employee well-being, from health, from physical health to safety, mental health. Uh, uh, good work. You know that you like what you do at work, from the working environment to line management, the demands, uh, autonomy, pay and reward, to values and principles on leadership, ethical standards, diversity. And of course, work can be a real social experience for people. So the employee voice, having positive work relationships, community and meaningful friendships are all important. And then there's personal growth. Everyone goes to work for different reasons. In career development, we have mentoring, coaching, lifelong learning, good lifestyle choices around physical activity, healthy eating, etc. And well-being also would include financial well-being, managing money well, uh, fair pay, retirement planning, and the rest of it. So it's quite broad, as you can see, the definitions. But I want to start in organizational design and strategy um, and the tech industry, there's a lot of myths out there. And I want to slay a few myths. So this slide is really um, with um, some, some insights from my friend, Professor Rob Brina. He's a professor of psychology and evidence-based management in London. And there are some myths. The first myth, well-being is a single thing. Well, it's not really. It's really not so simple. It's a complex and subjective area. And for scientists, it's important to have robust definitions and so you can home in on the specific problem you're trying to solve. The second myth, well, more well-being is always better. We always like to think if productivity is good, we want more of it. If profits are good, we want more of it. If health is good, we want more of it. But actually, it's unlikely that there's a linear relationship between well-being and performance. So it's best to really understand what's going on in your organization. The third myth, 
work conditions necessarily have a large impact on well-being. That's interesting because when you turn up at work, what you're bringing is, is your whole person, your health, your personality, your relationships, where you live, the community you live in, your wealth, all of these things contribute to how you're feeling. And so that's what we bring to work. So that makes interventions that we make in the workplace a little bit tricky. And the fourth myth, feeling good is good and feeling bad is bad. Well, actually, the psychologists say feeling a little bit bad uh, some of the time isn't a bad thing. You know, it's within the realm of normality and helps us understand ourselves and what's going on in the environment. Obviously, that can go, go too far on a scale of mental health. But too much of a good thing is, uh, is not always, always right. And I'll, I'll leave you with some um, resources um, uh, on this webinar. I've got some handouts um, and links to resources, including a video uh, from Rob that you can watch yourself. Now, I want to give some examples. What are companies doing to increase or manage well-being in their organizations? Well, here's a company called John Lewis. For those in the UK, you'll be familiar with the department stores and the supermarkets. And they employ about 80,000 employees, which they call partners, because they all have a stake in the business. And they run it as a democracy. It's really rather interesting. I worked there for a couple of years on a transformation program. And I can tell you, it does operate like a true democracy. Um, in, uh, the organizational changes are voted on. And there are committees to facilitate that. Anyway, they introduced um, an app called Unmind, which will give employees access to self-guided programs, uh, interactive courses for looking after mental health, and they're on improving sleep, nurturing relationships, reducing stress, or managing anxiety. Um, they're used um, from clinically backed insights, so mood diaries, reducing stigma and ambiguity, and act some actionable insights that you can actually change, make changes to. There's expressions of gratitude. Thank you for attending this webinar, everyone, for example. And there's supportive signposting. So really signposting is pointing people in the right direction, like a qualified health professional, where they may, might need that. And they have 24-7 confidential helplines to do that. Now, they're not going to work in every organization, and there's a cost to these. But I wanted to give you an example of what companies are doing in this space. Now, we've been going a few minutes now, and we're all in different parts of our working day. But what I'd like you to do is to sit back, take a sip of your chai or coffee, or whatever else you take to improve your well-being at this time of day. Shut your eyes and imagine. And I ask you to listen to this future scenario. Joe, an account manager, is being taken to her office in her bug car, her Beamer Uber Google driverless car. She is discussing her day with her automated coaching partner called Sirius. This is where I put on my robot voice. I noticed that you had less alpha rhythm sleep last night. I suggest you have some breakfast to increase your energy levels. At 11 o'clock, you have a meeting with the new client exec. She is usually skeptical initially, but does warm up. Remember to ask an open question and smile to make her feel at ease. I noticed that Lee, your insights manager, has a different socializing pattern and lower productivity since coming back from sick leave last week. It might be worth checking in with Lee today while you're in the office. I know, I know what you're thinking, everyone. This futuristic scenario requires you to suspend your disbelief. Firstly, it meshes together different data sets that we don't measure at the moment on performance, location, and personal biometric data. Secondly, it assumes we've got a robust framework for the prediction of behavior, and we're not quite there yet. And finally, it assumes employees like Joe are willing for employees to use their personal data on movement, diet, and performance in this way. So I mentioned Sirius, 
the app that Joe used. So here's another question for you. If you were offered the Sirius app by your boss, would you want to use it? You know this app that, that actually tracks uh, your sleep patterns, your diet, um, personal, gives you personality tips on your meetings. Um, would, you like to, would you like to use that if it's offered to your boss? So answer A, yes. Where can I sign up? Or no, no chance. I don't think I would trust my boss with that information and nor would my employees. This would be quite an interesting one. How many of you would like to have this app, if it existed? I'm not offering it to you, by the way. I don't think it exists. So while, while you're voting, let me tell you a story And uh, while you vote. In London, there was an outrage after the Daily Telegraph put censors under the journalist desks. So there's a lesson learned here. Always ask permission from employees to use their data, especially when your employees are journalists who tell the world. Um, and in the digital COVID era, millions of employees are working from home. There's reports of employees using surveillance to recreate the oversight that we have in the office at home. Now, it's important uh, for everyone's sense of autonomy and dignity and mental health that home remains a private space and they're trusted to do their work. Um, another example, the workforce tech industry has patents filed that gives wellness recommendations based on analysis of your emails and your conferencing platforms like Zoom or this. So for example, it might tell you, and your email to Princey sounded very harsh, um, or you interrupt Amy more than average on Zoom calls. So these are kind of recommendations. Watch out for these tools. Um, and if you're in a position to use them, use your influence to make sure they're used properly and ethically. So in my view, we can use these tools to empower workers, but do be careful to not spy on them. We don't want a form of digital tailorism. So I think the quantified worker will be introduced slowly, but only at the speed of employee trust. And looking at the answers to everybody, 56% want the Sirius app and 44% don't, which is rather interesting. So how does employee well-being relate to workforce metrics such as productivity? So here we're going into the, into the numbers a little bit, into the science. Um, so um, in discussions around improving productivity, the impact on sickness absence and presenteeism is important. For example, if an employee is not able to work or is working, but underperforming because they have illness or health issues, then this is obviously going to impact productivity. Um, so there are relationships between health measures and productivity. Let me tell you about a study from the London Underground, the, the Tube, as it's known. They found workers with obesity take an average of three sick days more every year than those of normal weight. Now, with this information, as people scientists, what do we do? In people analytics, we've got to be very careful of the so what uh, question. So we find out that obese workers might be less productive due to sickness absence. What do we do about it? Well, we need to empower workers to be healthier. Or do we hire people who are not obese? Well, I think this would be discriminatory and unethical. And I think we'll leave this uh, ethical discussion for now. Um, Gartner have cited research that looks at five different components of wellness. Now, if, for those who are only thriving in one of those, physical wellness, um, it has been found that they miss more work each year due to poor health. They're about three times more likely to file a worker's compensation claim. And they're five times more likely to seek out a new employer and more than twice as, as likely to actually move job, to leave. Now, Professor Carey Cooper describes how presenteeism can be inferred by asking people about how many absences they've had in a given period. 
and asking them separately whether their health is good or not good. So where people have low or no absences but have not good health, it does in indicate presenteeism. Now, the concept of employee lifetime value is the graph on the screen. It's borrowed from a marketing concept of customer lifetime value, and it can be used to look at how interventions impact overall employee productivity, not just the output over one year, but over their tenure. Now, I know that output is difficult to measure for certain employees, um, and it's not the only way to measure an employee's contribution but we've got to start somewhere. The Y vertical axis shows output or productivity. That might be sales revenues, for example. The X horizontal axis shows the tenure of the employee, how, how long they've worked at your company. As you can see, we have employee lifestyle interventions around pr productivity. Now, the aim of the game here is to extend the area under the graph by increasing productivity or increasing ten tenure. We can do that from hiring better people who are more productive. We can reduce good people leaving or attrition increases productivity. So keeping them longer increases productivity. And what about employee wellness? Well, I would suggest that reducing sickness absence and presenteeism and attrition would be obvious ways to increase productivity. Indirectly, your employee brand might attract better suited candidates if people realize that when they work for your company, you'll be looked after. So there's some, uh, some science behind that, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a minute. So how is employee well-being measured? And if HR are workforce scientists aiming to keep the organization happy and productive, what are the key measures? Well, the ONS a statistics body has developed four subjective well-being questions which can be incorporated into pulse surveys. So number one, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? Number two, overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? And that's eudaimonic pertaining to happiness. Three, how happy do you, did you feel yesterday? And four, how anxious did you feel yesterday? So for example, the civil service in the UK has incorporated these questions into their people survey to measure staff attitudes and experiences of work. Now you could create a simple survey using Zoho's global survey tool, I'm sure. Now I wanna give you another example of a large company that you'll know, uh, Amazon. I mean, Amazon, people go on about the robotics they use in their logistics warehouses, but they do employ 1.3 million around the world. And they've rolled out an app called My Strength. So this app is available to US employees, but their families and their households as part of a benefits package. So it's interactive and it guides individuals through uh, self-paced, evidence-based treatment for things like anxiety, stress, depression, substance abuse, sleep troubles, and other things. And it does provide signposting uh, for mental health services and support, including one-on-one -on -one counseling and crisis support at any time of the day. So similar to the John Lewis app. Um, so this provides uh, care to employees based on their preferences. And uh, as I've mentioned, to improve resilience. Now I wanna talk about the context here. I've mentioned a couple of apps, and there's a ton of technology we can use in workforce technology these days. If you look at the slide, you can look at um, uh, apps that look after your credentials using blockchain, virtual reality. We've mentioned analytics, wearables, and you see the picture of me on the right-hand side. This is me when I didn't, when I had a beard, actually, with my friend Harry, the HR robot. Would you believe it? So there's all sorts of technology we can use. Um, and this isn't just for big companies like Amazon and Unilever. With software as a service, we can try and pilot software for companies which have less than 500 employees and 100 employees. We can try it out. So an example would include Zoho's Office Readiness app, which can circulate and collect self-assessment 
and contact tracing forms amongst employees and oversees organization-wide information about their health status. So this module provides industry-approved surveys and organizations can decide the frequency of uh, employees taking it based on, you know, your policy. So what, are the, what kind of solutions are used by employers? Well, as I mentioned, the well-being tech industry is booming. According to one study, there are more than a quarter of a million smartphone apps supporting healthcare currently on the market. Um, and these tools in corporate digital mental health, they raised a billion dollars last year in funding, in including one called Lyra Health, which raised $200 million. Now, the work, workplace health interventions tend to fall into six categories. We have platforms, trackers, and monitoring found in employee benefit programs. And this includes data from wearables or app, apps. We have wearables. And actually, PwC estimate that, that there are 75 million wearables being used globally in the workplace. We've got well-being companies that provide employee assistant programs, chatbots and apps. Um, for example, with Babylon Health, it enables you to connect virtually to a medical professional. And these are getting more sophisticated, and they can be used to track sleep disorders, help with meditation, addiction, mood trackers, and to record fatigue, telemedicine and telehealth, and of course, education, coaching, um, occupational health and safety. Um, now, Microsoft, who you'll know, another example, they use surveys to survey their staff. They survey more than 2,500 employees every day, but they make sure that one person only gets a survey every quarter. And this data helps them to identify issues in the workforce like burnout, stress, work-life balance, and hundreds of other issues. Now, I have another question for you. In your view, does improved employee well-being lead to improved productivity? If your gut reaction, please, just answer one. One is A, surely yes. Yes, employee well-being surely leads to improving productivity. B, I'm a bit more skeptical. Not really. And C, Andy, I've got no idea about this question. What's your gut reaction to this? Well, it looks like the vast majority of you have given the response that yes, employee well being leads to improved productivity. That is based on your experience and knowledge 88, 90%. That is interesting. So let us look at the evidence from the scientific community and other analysts. Does employee well-being drive productivity? Show me the evidence. Intuitively, being happy and healthy would seem to boost the bottom line. But for the scientists, finding causal links between employee engagement and productivity are harder to establish. In HR, there's a long debating history of, of, of looking for evidence that employee engagement leads to higher productivity. It's difficult to find good evidence, good quality evidence, and academics will lock horns on debates around correlation versus causation. So, on the one hand, I will provide some evidence from Gallup. Gallup conducted a meta-analysis of 339 studies including well-being and productivity, over nearly 2 million employees in 80,000 business units from 230 organizations in 49 industries in 73 countries. It sounds like they asked everybody we know. Now, they looked at four business KPIs that are important for business and their relationship with employee satisfaction. Here is what they found. Number one, customer loyalty. They found a substantial positive correlation with customer loyalty. 
two, employee productivity. They found that there was a correlation with productivity, which is positive and strong. That coincides with 90% of you on this webinar's view. Three, on profitability measures, they found a moderately positive correlation between employee satisfaction and profitability. And on staff turnover, they found a negative correlation with staff turnover. To summarize, from their meta-analysis, we cannot make any strong causal claim about the effect of employee well-being on productivity. There exists, however, both theoretical and empirical literature that points in this direction. Now, I'll give you evidence on the other hand. Researchers went to the Google and the app stores and identified 1,400 mental health apps. There's so many out there. They looked at the, the highest ranking, 70, and they looked at their claims. 60-odd percent of them claimed that they effectively diagnosed conditions, improved symptoms or mood, mood and fostered self better self-management. They, they, half of them used scientific language to support these claims. Yet the evidence wasn't commonly described, and most of the evidence was anecdotal. So in other words, these claims were made without proper scientific evidence. And from a literature review by King's College, they were a bit more sanguine. They said, we find that there's some evidence that workplace interventions can improve mental health and well-being outcomes although the size of the effect is often small. So that was their conclusion. Do your own research and make your own mind up, folks. Now, I'm going to conclude with some pointers for healthy and productive organizations. In summary, an individual's well-being is not the responsibility of the employer. However, an employer should not make it worse and hopefully empower individuals to improve their well-being with interventions. Now, I think HR has a key role in ensuring people are safe at work, but also have the conditions to flourish at work. To improve well-being in the workforce, the solution is not to focus on a particular tech solution or create another HR silo. The longer-term solution for HR is to generally improve workforce analytics, culture, processes, and leadership to ensure that the organization has the capability to make necessary changes. So for HR leaders, this can mean ensuring your emphasis, you emphasize the role of HR as the workforce scientist, as well as technology evangelist. Number one, adopt a holistic approach to workforce design and effectiveness. Good work design is fundamental to both well-being and productivity. As I mentioned before, in, in the medical analogy, just like well-being requires a holistic approach to health, we also need to have a holistic approach when we look at organizational problems. Number two, listen to your workers. You might be in an office with seven people and you can talk to them and listen to them. It's really natural to you as good people. Um, but if you've got 150,000 people, then you need other, you might need to use technology to listen to workers. Now, this is a critical business process, not a HR process. We can use employee sentiment, feedback, um, and this is going to be really useful for your hiring and, and attri reducing attrition. It's also worth mentioning that not all your workers are employees. They might be freelancers or temps. So your well-being strategy needs to include these people too. You need to evaluate what works in your organization, not what works for Microsoft or Unilever or Zoho. You need to do your own research and critically assess the best evidence. Start with the problems that you need to solve, not the solutions, and try and ask better questions. Number four, definitely try new technology. It's not the whole answer, but it can help you to improve inclusion, fairness, and productivity if it's implemented sensibly using an evidence-based approach. Five, maintain a well-tuned workforce measurement engine, like I've mentioned before, and empower workers to be healthier and more productive, but don't spy on them. I know you won't, but just, just because we can measure it, it doesn't mean we should measure it. Now, I've got some useful resources that I pulled together for you um, that you can look at in your own time 
Hopefully, Princey, we can put these on the chats so or we can we can share them with people who have attended today. There's um, health and well-being at work from the CIPD. There's a guide that I pulled together called Zoom Back to the Office, um, which is a guide for leaders on the Workforce Futurist newsletter. There's the literature review from King's College I mentioned, and the full Gallup report for those who are, want to look at the data themselves. And also the video from Professor Rob Brina. Now, that concludes uh, my session on, on well-being and productivity. Just to summarize, there is a compelling moral case for improving employee well-being as the right thing to do. And the pandemic has really brought this home for us. But there's also a clear business case for improving the bottom line. So as I said at the beginning, three things I want you to take away from this webinar. One, employee well-being is worth measuring and understanding in your organization. Two, the approach to monitoring and improving employee well-being is similar to other workforce goals. Three, this is an area where HR can take a real lead as people scientists and technologists. So good luck, and I hope you and your family and organization stay healthy. Keep in touch with me on Twitter or subscribing to Workforce Futurist or email. And thanks again to Princey and Soho people. Now, I do hope we have some time for some questions. So, Princey, did we have any questions? Hi, everyone. Feel free to drop your questions on the questions tab on the left panel or in the chat box. So um, meanwhile, we will uh, just have a brief overview of Zoho people. And uh, we'll still have the uh, a few minutes for question and answers. So for people who do not know what Zoho People is, and uh, we have uh, two different products. So one is uh, Zoho People, which is a cloud-based uh, HR software. And Zoho People Plus is a combination of uh, six different Zoho applications coming together, which includes uh, Zoho Recruit, People, Expense, and uh, communication apps like Zoho Connect and uh, Zoho Click. So uh, moving forward into uh, how Zoho people can help you with your HR uh, activities, as uh, Andrew, Andrew was telling, we have a health check form, a survey which will help an employees um, register their, uh, uh, their health every day. And this in turn, let's just say if someone's feeling sick or if their family member is feeling sick, you can enable automatic email notifications to the right person in charge within your organization. So um, whether you have to uh, provide them with any kind of help, you can always do that and it will notify the right person immediately. And uh, productivity is all about how you manage work and how you manage your teams, right? So Zoho People comes in with a built-in integration with Zoho Click. So this is where uh, this enables better collaboration within your teams and uh, whether it's audio calls or video calls, you can do it all from within the uh, Zoho People app itself. And, and also an important feature here is employees do need their breaks. And whenever they're going on a break, they can always say that they're away and uh, it will help them have their break time just for themselves. And a major part of managing productivity is how well your work environment is right so whether it's about assigning goals to your employees or managing their work or giving them feedback all of this can be done seamlessly with zoho people and not just that feedback is also a bigger part of uh, employee performance so with uh, zoho people you'll be able to give instant feedbacks and you can also have self appraisals as part of your review process and we also do have a learning and uh, development system. So that's a space where you can create customized learning plans for uh, your employees or their specific uh, departments. It comes with both self-paced and instructor-led courses. So you can have both, um, like, just like how we're doing it now, you can have virtual sessions. We, uh, it comes with an inbuilt integration with Zoho Meeting. 
and course feedback and discussions and everything that is needed to improve your courses is uh, is also done seamlessly with Zoho people. And the most important part is your performance and learning should go hand in hand, right? So with performance, Zoho's LMS and performance is quite integrated. So all the skills that your employees have or if, if they want to improve something, uh, their skills are mapped here in the LMS and the managers can also suggest courses based on what is required. And even if you have any skill gaps or anything, managers can always go back and look at the employees' competencies, their skills, and suggest courses. And we also have an integration with Zoho Analytics. So with this, you can manage any kind of information that you need. All the insights you need will be there right with your fingertips. And whether it's your employee performance report or uh, it's your employee growth report, your attrition reports, all of this can be available. And you can also go ahead and create your monthly or uh, based on your requirements, you can go ahead and create your own reports too. So uh, as Andy was talking about it, we do have an office readiness app. And I'm pretty sure not all organizations have are working in full capacity, right? So you need to know which of your employees are working from the office, your visitor management. All of this has to be taken care of without any glitches, right? So office readiness is a, a space where we come with uh, visitor management and your office management uh, as well. So which of your uh, branches are operational or which of your sites are operational can be updated and you can have a specific person in charge for all of this, each of these locations taking care of your back-end work. So that's pretty much about Zoho people. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the questions tab. You can visit us at zoho.com slash people and you can write to us at webinars at zohopeople.com. We uh, also have a HR community where HR professionals from different uh, uh, from around the globe come together and share their experiences. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for the session today. I, I really hope uh, everyone uh, here at, who attended the session found it useful. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, it was a wonderful session, very interactive. And um, so we'll be signing off for now, and we hope to see you in another webinar. Thank you. Bye, everyone.